Welcome back to the Hour and Vice podcast. My name is Nima. My name is Aaron. And today we're joined by a very, very special guest, Dr. Marshall, an Australian physician, Nobel Prize laureate in physiology and medicine, and a professor of clinical microbiology at the University of Western Australia. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for taking the time out to sit down with us. Um, for all of our viewers, can you just explain a little bit about your current role right now? Uh, well, I'm uh, a clinical professor and uh, of, of uh, medicine and microbiology, and I'm the director of the Marshall Centre. So at the University of Western Australia, we uh, put my name on it, but effectively uh, infectious disease people. So from all groups, there's about a dozen people who are faculty members in the Marshall Centre, and they would be into uh, microbiology and genomics and virology, uh, proteomics, epidemiology, areas like that related <coughs> usually to infectious disease uh, in some way. And so uh, in, in, in there is the Helicobacter Research Lab. And uh, we have a few people there. We often have visiting scholars and different students. And there is a, a, a very interesting course there called Masters of Infectious Disease, which is quite popular. And uh, you know, people come from all over the world, do one or two years. Uh, it's almost almost uh, uh, like a PhD. You can do six months of research into that <laughs> two years. So it's pretty good. And um, people who've done that course, I keep, when I go on my travels around the world and developing countries in different places, I sometimes uh, meet them who've been to that course and it's, they're usually having that's a awesome. successful career afterwards. So that's great. Perfect. So I want to take it back all the way to the beginning. Let's, let's yeah. describe your childhood and your life growing up. Were you a troublemaker? Were you... I was not totally uh, blameless in a few episodes, but um, <clears throat> so I was born in Kalgoorlie, uh, which is a massive gold, uh, gold mine there. It's been going for a hundred years now. So it's like one of these great big super pits, they call it. And um, my father was a fitter, which is a mechanical engineer sort of thing. Uh, and he of course was working on the railway yards and mining equipment, things like that when he, his apprenticeship my mother was a nurse and so I was born in 1951 and uh, I didn't realize at the time that there was a lot of hardship in those days because was right <laughs> after the second world war all kinds of things were rationed and so if you wanted to buy build a house you had to find where am I going to get the bricks or the bits of pipe or the iron things like that so it was pretty difficult and they had um, a model a Ford which had my father had fixed up. So there's a Model T. And then 1930s, they had the Model A, which is like um, Elliot Ness and the Untouchables, you know, like that that thing. Uh, and it had running boards on it and everything. And so they took off to uh, get a job uh, in a big uranium mine that was starting up. So the back background of that is that the US needed uranium for making plutonium bombs and everything because the Cold War was starting. And... Um, they didn't think there was enough uranium to make enough bombs or nuclear power or anything. So they said, we'll pay double for any uranium in the world that you can dig up and uh, to sell it to us. No questions asked. So a big uranium mine then started up in Australia and my parents are great. We you know, get good jobs there, big money. Um, but halfway there, the, the, the car broke down and we ended up in Carnarvon, which is on the West coast of Australia. So they had to go, all the way around about 2000 miles right up to the top where the uranium was. But they got halfway there, but there was a, a whaling station there who needed uh, tradesmen. And so my father was, his first big job was um, mechanical fitter, uh, fitter on the whaling station. So they were, you know, catching whales. He then worked on whaling boats and uh, lobster fishing, things like that. And then he worked uh, chicken, uh, managing a chicken factory and, and then Kentucky, fried was invented in the 60s and all of a sudden everyone in the world started eating 10 times more chicken than usual so it was a great business so he had a successful career as an engineer in a chicken factory and uh, we always lived in um, Perth Western Australia after that Perth people always say to me what's Perth like I say well it's like Los Angeles in 1950 you know, the sky is clean, the blue skies, not much traffic. Uh, but it's a very nice place to live now because uh, with the internet and everything, you know, we can do these kinds of 
uh, collaborations and I collaborate with people all over the world and uh, went spent 10 years in the US um, uh, after I made the discovery with Dr. Warren of the stomach bugs and um, I learned a lot there and came back and still kind of semi successful in research but I do a lot of things now as a Nobel laureate a lot of people asking you to do all kinds of diverse things and traveling which is uh, interesting but I keep, but you when you're a researcher, you know, you do nothing else but focus on your project and write your grant yeah. for about three or four yeah. months with no interruptions. You won't talk to anybody. You work on a weekend. <laughs> I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so, well, I thought 30 years of that was enough. And I sort of quietened down a little bit now. So I have people who in my lab who are doing that, I guess. Well, that's a great story. Um, what is something that most people probably don't know about you? Uh, um, uh, they know everything about me as far as I can tell, <laughs> but, uh, I was always, um, when I was in, in school, I was interested in, uh, you know, chemistry and physics, uh, mathematics and things like that. But, uh, when I was in, high school I had a bad case of the flu for two weeks just when we were starting to learn calculus so I always had trouble with calculus and high level mathematics in the last year of high school and I, I came away I sort of felt that I wasn't good at it for some reason everybody else could do it in the class but I, I used to struggle with it and so uh, after high school I, I had two opportunities I could do medicine or I could do electrical engineering and uh, I was tra attracted to both, but I ended up doing medicine because I didn't think I was good enough on math to do electrical engineering. And um, so now I do medicine, of course, and all those uh, things. Obviously, successful. To most, <laughs> so it was a good, good choice. Uh, but um, my hobby is uh, electronic engineering. Uh, not electronic engineering, but electronics and uh, resurrecting yeah. vintage gadgets and computers and retro stuff uh, and all that sort of thing. So it's a great so, hobby to have. It's a lot like, of, it's getting very popular. Yeah. Like, like you said, you're, you're a hobbyist and you actually got a scholarship to do electrical engineering out of high school. Um, what yeah, so I had a scholarship. I could be a penniless medical student or a funded electrical engineer <laughs> so i don't know the electrical engineering might have been fun as well there's a lot of uh, advances in the last uh, 40 years or so since i was in university that it would have you know that, that was also a skyrocketing career but um because i could do both i was one of the very few doctors so starting in the 70s and then in the 80s hardly any medicos knew anything about computers and uh, so I had even gone to a summer school and I could build one. I did build one actually published my first paper on my own homebrew computer. So uh, not many people could do that. Yeah. And so it, it lifted me up out of the pack, if you like. And whereas most people would have trouble managing their data, mm -hmm. no problem for me because I had a computer and I could easily put, I had 500 patients in it. I sort them out by age and sex and all the kinds of things I wanted to do. Uh, so it, I realized then that medicine is the communication business. So the patient has to communicate what's wrong. You've got to suck it in and communicate back advice or some diagnostic tests or something. And I realized then that a lot of it, you know, ninety percent of it, or ninety-five percent of it, is like what we're doing right now. This face-to-face -face interaction, and people who are good at that are good doctors and will make the right diagnosis because they get the information. And uh, people um, who don't know it, so they think the doctors, you know, he has to have his stethoscope hanging around his neck <laughs> as listening. Oh yeah, oh yeah, ah. But in fact, when you put the stethoscope on the patient, I think you already have to know what you're going to hear. He's like, ah, yes, this confirms it, mitral stenosis or something. So uh, that, that, that's the trick. Uh, it's the knowledge business. And being connected to IT and computers all my life now, it just facilitated and accelerated the, the things that I was interested in with the 
ulcers and all that because there's a lot of information out there that I had to filter. So explain your medical school experience. How how was that for you? You get different. I get different answers when I ask people. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's stressful because one of the problems with medical school is that you've got you know this much data and you've only got this much time to assimilate exactly. it all. So you've got to really pick the bits. You've got to try and figure out what are the important bits and focus on that. Uh, so it is important that you do go to your lectures and, 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 and try to figure out what the lecturer and the uh, uh, you know, specialists uh, think is important because that's what's going to be asked in the exam. So part of it is a, is a bit of gamesmanship as to passing that exam. But the interesting thing is in my medical school, we had um, the class was 90, usually 90 students. And then <clears throat> the year before uh, I started medical school, they said, we're gonna increase the class up to about 108 or some number like that, another 15 or 20 students, which was significant, like 20% increase almost. And um, anyway, halfway through the first year of medicine, they figured out they didn't have the budget. <laughs> and they said, look, um, but, uh, sorry about this fellas, but uh, or go, or guys and girls, um, we're going, we are going to have to fail and get this class down to 90 again. So 15 of you people are going to get cut from first year. And we'll have to either go to go and do chemistry or something else, or, uh, you know, just fail and just leave the university <laughs> or repeat. If you, if you were good, you know, if you had some special thing, uh, you might be able to repeat. So probably half of you will repeat and then there'll be this attrition. And so every year, that means there was always going to be some who were repeating from the previous year and <sighs> some would drop out, you know, so there's always this pressure. We knew that there was always going to be, we say 10 people are going to fail minimum. Wow. So, um, but there's two ways of looking at this, you see. So uh, some people who are really studious kind of people, they'd be studying 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I ought to pass. I got to pass, got to get the great marks. But I figured out that I just had to find the 10 people that I could beat. <laughs> once, I, <laughs> once I knew that those 10 people could be beaten, then I just had to be a couple above just for security. So I ended up being one of these terrible students that would, you know, I, did, I didn't go crazy, you know, but I used to go to lectures and everything, but I didn't really stress until about two weeks before the exam. And then I was, then I studied 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I just got to get, remember this until Sunday and it's over and I'm on. <laughs> So I did that. It's it's, a, it's good and bad, um, and I I suppose um, you know you, it would be better if you could have a consistent approach. But yeah. I suppose when you think about it, it's you've got to be sustainable. So you can't do like a hundred and fifty percent effort every day for a whole year. You get burned out. So you do have to do some other things. Go to the beach go out to a yeah. few parties, get drunk occasionally, you know, <laughs> whatever you might do. You, you do those things because that just takes the pressure, makes you back into normality again. Uh, and so that's how I went through my years. Um, I, one other story related to that is in my, I used to always be pretty careful about my Pratt class and I write up my books. And then on this side of me and on that side of me were two friends of mine who always used to carry copy my lab notes, you see, because they would miss half the labs. <laughs> and some people in this sounds medicine, like a lot they, like us. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to keep a sense of humor with it. But you know, that's that's the interesting thing about medicine. You know, smart people usually there's a lot of funny stuff going on. But um, so they these guys would want to copy some lab notes, and and some med students that are in the class say, "No, nah, I you know I got to pass this year." I'm not letting you see my lab notes. I was there like, oh, you know, I, surely I can let my friends see my lab notes. So I used to show them my lab notes. But the problem is they never learnt it. They just copied it. And they never learnt it. And they both failed. Oh, wow. So, so um, 
they they then went off and they did had good careers in uh, biology and different things like that but they they couldn't stay in the focused uh, medical course um after that were, were there so, any, yeah. were there any particular moments or patients from medical school that stood out that you still remember to this day um i'm trying to think uh well i <clears throat> i had a few a few lessons I, you know, one of the hardest things in medicine especially in clinical medicine is when you've got a patient with an altered mental state or you know so mentally is not there and you you realize then how important it is to be able to get the 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 story from the patient what's going on and uh I just used to think, feel as when I was doing geriatrics on one year as a student, you know, I kept getting these patients who they didn't speak English, like really old ladies who didn't speak English. I had something strange wrong with them and uh, trying to, you know, that would be your patient for the week and trying to clerk that patient and, and, you know, get a plan and everything until I realized that nobody could do it. If this wasn't just because I was hopeless <laughs> and a medical student, Nobody could really manage those patients. You just, at that point, you had to fall back on that, the physical examination and talk to the patients, relatives and things like that. So uh, again, it, the, what do I say to people if they're asking me about a research program or something, I'd say, find something that's the hardest and try and do that. Uh, if you succeed, you'll be a hero. If you don't succeed, you'll just be the same as everybody else. You know, couldn't do it. <coughs> Um, and so, so that's kind of, um, uh, you know, you take the easy way, you know, you might get off a bit earlier, but uh, taking the hard road uh, will get you more respect, I think. Uh, I, had a, I had a nice uh, a teacher in, um, a clinical uh, teacher in one of my hospital terms, actually final year of medicine. He said, well, if you don't like studying, just see a lot of patients and you will know you'll know by the patients you see what's important and what's common. And that's yeah. most of the exam that would get you through. Yeah. And so uh, I used to, as a med student, I was always hanging around the ER on the weekends, <laughs> stitching up people who fell over drunk, you know, <laughs> cut themselves and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I became quite good, quite adept at, uh, you know, minor surgeries and very confident at it, which was good. And um, I, at that time, I thought I'd probably do surgery, but uh, I, I ended up doing medicine. I, I realized that once you've done an operation five, six, ten times, you've learned it. Now, what, now what do you do? <clears throat> and uh, I found that a lot of surgeons used to spend time thinking, looking through magazines of yachts and what's what's the next gadget they're going to get on their yacht or something or what sort of golf what golf course they're going to go to that kind of thing because <laughs> you know the surgery was just a a money earner to have the fun parts they, they weren't necessarily having all that fun in their surgery so uh, surgery was uh, it was quite exciting and um but i i felt that it was mentally it might not be as challenging uh and i in a, I was in a, a six-year medical course, so you went straight through. You didn't do an undergraduate degree like in the US. Um, I know you guys, you do, you do a four-year degree, and in the first four years, you're supposed to do some humanities or, you know, you can do philosophy and different things. It's a bit more general. Mm -hmm. So I think the American students that I met uh, and young doctors are more rounded than in Australia where you come out of high school, you go straight into university, got to do that six years, focus on medicine, get past... And, and although you might be then a doctor or an intern, you didn't have a, a broad life experience. And it, and it was a negative thing when you started talking to patients, um, you know, from all the different works of life. And so I, uh, you know, I had a mixed life and my father was a tradesman and um, I had done summer jobs all over the place, washing trucks, shoveling dirt, uh, all building sites, that kind of stuff. So it was not a difficult issue with me but i know there were some uh guys in my year who you know their parents were professional they were lawyers or their dad mum and dads were doctors or something like that and they you know lived in a nice neighborhood and went to a private school and, and then get thrown into a public hospital where <laughs> you say, 
how much you you can get paranoid in a public hospital yeah. after a few years <laughs> is is the whole world going crazy or <laughs> and uh, you sort of step back a bit so uh, but i i loved medicine no matter what i did i loved it and i'd come home to my wife i'd say oncology is so great that's what i'm going to do and then she said you said that out rheumatology last month you know, so, so it's it's a wonderful thing to do so it's a privilege to do it i guess so throughout your medical journey how did you know you wanted to specialize in what you're doing now <clears throat> uh so it started uh, i had a a, a friend uh, at the end of um i think second year internship <clears throat> and uh, at that point uh, you you don't have a guaranteed job anymore so you stay in the hospital's mm -hmm. training or you go out or whatever and so <clears throat> i had a friend and he had decided to go into the physician training scheme and i had just finished a surgical term and i was thinking well you know i was actually invited to do surgery by the professor of surgery um and uh, probably because I had a, a not, I didn't just have practical skills. I was just uh, common sense medicine. So if there's an emergency or something, I just seem to be able to handle it and mostly do some something useful rather than freaking out. Um, but a friend of mine, uh, he was actually a diabetic on insulin and he said he was going to do medicine and he's interested in endocrinology or something. And he said, why don't you come along to the training program? So I did. And then I found it was very, very interesting and very useful because to earn extra money, my wife and I used to do these uh, radio controlled uh, home visits on the weekends and late at night, like usually Saturday night, Sunday night. And you would uh, just have a, a two way radio in your car and your box of medical stuff. And then people, uh, general practitioners who subscribe to it, if their patients called in, they would get rerouted into a call center and they would say, there's a four year old child with asthma at such and yeah. such address, you know, you could go and do it. So that was good money. And um, as I was doing the uh, internal medicine training, I started to, I realized then that I was making interesting diagnoses uh, in the middle of the night. And I was, you know, <clears throat> I'd be able to send patients into the hospital. And then the next morning or the next Monday, I could go around to the wards and see what's happened to these patients. So it was a really very rewarding experience for me. Um, and uh, so I liked internal medicine. So I hammered away at the internal medicine. In Australia, what you do, it's similar to the US. So they use the College of Physicians questionnaires, uh, uh, question sets and everything. So the, the written is pretty similar. Uh, and then the um, then we had a, a, a clinical exam, an oral exam sort of viva so that was pretty tough because you would from perth or somewhere you'd have to go to another sydney cities like sydney or melbourne and um these then you'd have some horrible legendary cruel <laughs> neurologist standing beside the bed asking you to examine the patient's leg or <laughs> that kind of thing so it was very <laughs> threatening and uh, it took me two goes to go through i think i did the oral I did the written and then I had two goes at the oral failed both. And then a, a year later, I just seen more patients, more experience and uh, did the written again and then passed it. And then I went, then I went into um, just internal medicine training. Uh, so that you do three years with six month rotations through different jobs. Like you do you know, neurology, chest disease, cardiology, different ones. Yeah. And, um, so I was doing one of those at Royal Perth Hospital and uh, at the be usually at the beginning of each term, you try to get a clinical research project. Okay. And so <clears throat> the College of Physicians in Australia, they say, well, you, you do the standard training, then uh, you're supposed to have a case report or a series or try and publish a paper, something like that to show that you, you're trying a bit harder. And uh, I had various interesting projects that were on the go but when i got into when i started on gastroenterology so i was not a gastroenterology trainee i was like the ward resident that okay. looked after all the disasters but and attended set the endoscopies up was not learning endoscopy really and um i uh spoke to my boss who's a very very nice guy called tom waters and uh, i said to him what i need a research project what sort of research have you guys got on the go and he said well we did not do really much research here but there's this in that cupboard have a look in that cupboard they've got all the data from our patients the last 10 years of endoscopies why don't you go and analyze that for us and tell us 
what's going on? And I looked in there and they had these um, cards called Kalamazoo cards. You ever heard of those? No. They're a piece of cardboard yeah. like, you know, like this. And all yeah. around the edge, you've got these different diagnoses, uh, you know, duodenal ulcer, gastric ulcer, esophagitis, whatever. And then, um, so you pick it up, you write the patient's name on it, and then you have a punch. And you go around the side and you, you punch along the edges. You can't see that piece of paper, I know. <laughs> you punch along the edges of it where the different diagnoses are. And then you chuck, chuck it in the cupboard for 10 years. And then what you do is you put all these cards in a rack and you put a pin across where the duodenal ulcer is going to be chopped out, you see. And then it vibrates and brrr, And then all the duodenal ulcers would drop down a centimetre. And so it's like sorting cards. So you do that kind of stuff different ways. And then you could do statistics on. Okay. Whatever. Anyway, by then I had a computer and I knew that bits of cardboard was not going to cut it. It was, had to be something <laughs> better than that. <clears throat> I said, well, what else have you got? <laughs> and he said, well, Dr. Warren, a uh, pathologist has given me this list of 20 patients. Who, and he saw these bacteria in their stomach. And he's, reckons it's pretty interesting, pretty exciting. Why don't you, and he wants somebody to go and chase up these patients, find out what's wrong with them. Because uh, Warren's receiving biopsies, which is usually check this ulcer for cancer. Take this, this is a cancer. What, what's this? You know? So um, he couldn't really, he didn't have any clinical information much from the gastroenterologists. So they would just rule out cancer, rule out ulcer. And um, so he gave me these, I think, 22 patients. And I said, oh, that's pretty interesting. I looked down and one of the patients in the middle of that list was a middle-aged woman who had been on my service in the general medical ward. We couldn't find out what's wrong with her. She had abdominal pain all the, pain, all the time. Mm -hmm. She had an endoscopy and she had just a bit of redness in the stomach. And um, the gastroenterologist had taken a biopsy of the red area or something, sent it to Dr. Warren. So we couldn't find anything wrong with this woman except that she had gastritis, she had inflammation in the stomach, but that wasn't a clinical disease because everybody mm -hmm. in, in some countries, like hundred percent of people in Japan had it. You just got it yeah. worse as you got older in the U S it would have been about 50% in those days. So it's very common of no relevance. And it was particularly of no relevance because even if you had gastritis, if you had an ulcer, we could heal it up with a H2 blocker. And the gastritis remained and the ulcer went away. So obviously they're just totally disconnected. It's just irrelevant. Um, so no one was interested in gastritis. And um, I went down and uh, I was interested because of this woman. In the end, my boss had said, look, we can't figure out what's wrong with you. We think you're depressed. So here's an appointment for the psychiatrist. Go and get a psychiatric opinion. And of course, the psychiatrist said, well, you know, she's got lots of pain. That might be why she's de depressed. <laughs> but here, take these antidepressants and go home. So that was <clears throat> probably the last I ever saw of that woman. Yeah. But uh, of course, I saw a biopsy when I went down, had a look under the microscope with Dr. Warren. I said, well, that's impressive. There's a lot of neutrophils there. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I said, I can see that you might have a sore stomach if you had this. It seems not out of this, not outrageous. And so um, I went off then and started looking for all the causes, what, how these people could get these bacteria in the stomach. And, but we didn't know how common it was because Warren had just picked 20 positive cases, you see. So he might have seen 100 cases that week, 500 or something. So um, he, he didn't know how common it was. He didn't know the indications for biopsy and everything. <clears throat> and um, so I was interested in the bacteria and we took some biopsies and scram stained them. We could see them there. And then um, my dad was uh, of course in the chicken business, which is the home of Campylobacter jejuni, which you catch off raw chickens, you know? Yep. So I went, I went, I wrote an application to him and the boss at the chicken factory and said, um, I'm, you know, Campylobacter, that's a hot bacteria at the moment. And um, we found some in the stomach and I'd really like to come by the chicken factory and, maybe you guys would give me a research grant and I could study these Campylobacters and, and look for them in chickens. <laughs> they sort of said, no way is anyone going to be looking for bacteria in our chicken factory. It's totally clean. And we do, if it's not, we don't want to know about it. So uh, that was not successful. Uh, but anyway, I, Warren and I, we tried for six months to um, culture these bacteria and we were 
other people were kind of looking over our shoulders. It's gee, that's pretty interesting. And then uh, my boss said, Barry, well, you haven't got a job next year. Why don't you try and get a job and do some more research on these bacteria? Because they are kind of interesting and uh, you might be able to culture them or something. So I uh, spoke around, you know, went to the College of Physicians uh, um, end of year research day. We had a little poster up or something and we spoke to them and um, someone said, oh yeah, well, I can give you an internal medicine job. We'll do lots of endoscopy as well because we do more general, we do both and uh, train you up in endoscopy. Oh, those bacteria seem interesting. We'll do that. Why don't you do that? And um, uh, also, but you, you really need to get get data that's publishable. This is just anecdotal because you've just been randomly picking people. So you've got to figure out how to do that. So I said, uh, so I wrote a protocol. We're going to study a hundred patients, no selection, all coming through endoscopy. And uh, we would send, we, we do blinded analysis. So the pathologist to get a sample, the micro gets a sample, tries to culture it. Um, and the, um, and uh, Dr. Marshall, you would uh, do the clinical information on the patient and no one would know what the other person was finding. It'd be blinded. Dr. Warren would do his path reports. We weren't allowed to look at them. And then when we did a hundred, we did the analysis. So that I went ahead and did that. And of course, I was sort of going past my um, gastro six months at that point. I was doing hematology. It was chaos, and I was but I was working a lot of late hours, um, and um, we we're doing bone marrow transplants. And of course, we didn't really have very good uh, immunosuppressants in those days. And the bone marrow transplant patient I was looking after got CMV and died. So it was a bit of a disastrous uh, term in some ways. But I was doing the uh, gastroenterology in my spare time around the edge, setting the patients up and questionnaires and that. And then the second six months of 1982, they said, I said, look, I need money. So I've got too many children and if you go, I'll take the job up in the outback, up in the north of Western Australia, Port Hedland. And I'd be the, I was the third year trainee at that point. So I could become the, the acting chief of the hospital. So it's, a, it's like a 200 bed hospital. So I thought, yeah, I'll do that. So I got up there, a lot of tax breaks and things. So they only, of course, they only had about two channels on the TV. So at <laughs> night you didn't have anything to do except study or whatever. And so I was researching the bugs and putting the data together from the different sources. And that's when it struck me that we might've discovered the cause of duodenal ulcer. It just seemed so impossible that these bacteria hadn't been seen before, hadn't really been studied. But when I put all the information together, everything fitted. And I spoke to Warren about it and we started, you know, our excitement level was going up and up and up and up. And like, we were just like doing backflips almost. <laughs> that surely this couldn't be it. So we were testing it lots of different ways, uh, looking at other patients and um, looking at the literature. And most of the really good literature on ulcers was actually from the US, but people hadn't connected it up. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that happened that year so it's 1982, <clears throat> the um, National Library of Medicine in Bethesda went online. So it was kind of online with a primitive internet called um, TimeNet. It was ARPANET was the beginning of the internet in 1968. Yes. And that was, to, that was Cold War stuff, plus a few universities. But by 1982, they then made it international and anyone in the world could get on a telex machine and put in a text-based literature search. Um, so the librarian knew how to do that, but we used to have to fill out these forms, uh, like your search, you fill out all these fields and everything, give it to the librarian, and then she would type it in, and then in the middle of the night, it would all come back along the telex. So it'd print out fold, these folded pages, 20 pages or so. So a lot of the stuff we could get would be um, just, like a normal literature search, the, the midline title, and then a hundred words of the, of the abstract. So anything in the past 10 years <clears throat> pretty much had an abstract in the computer. Uh, 
and then uh, we looked through all the textbooks on pathology and we found all kinds of leads about these bacteria. So usually it would probably that someone was doing their six month trainee and then they had a six months project. Oh, study gastritis or bacteria. Right. At end of six months, they write a poster and then they go on to a job, become a cardiologist or something else, never go back to it. And so um, we had been doing it then for about two years, you see, or 18 months when we started to get all this information online. And uh, one of the resources that we had, and people don't realize you can, that there's still important is, is old medical books. And so uh, we had some old pathology books. Um, and then you would see a picture that looks like gastritis or it looks like it could have bacteria in it. So you'd say, where's the reference? It might be a reference, a veterinary reference. And so we would go to the veterinary literature and we pull out this photograph of gastric mucosa of the dog with these spiral <laughs> bacteria all over it or a, an old pathology book where there's beautiful black and white EMs of the bacteria from all over, all kinds of sources. Okay. And so we started to uh, try and, figure out what was going on here <clears throat> and uh, we resurrected the information that people had forgot about and um, people had said my, my boss said to me and he was trained at the Mayo Clinic actually so he's about he's about in his not he's probably 90 now but he had trained at the um, Mayo Clinic and um, he said um, it's very strange Barry that all your patients duodenal ulcer patients have got gastritis because in, in duodenal ulcer, the stomach is normal. And so the, there was this concept that peptic ulcer, there was two types. There was ones in the duodenum. They were never me malignant. They had high acid secretion. They're very chronic and everything. Uh, but in those, they never wouldn't get a simultaneous gastric ulcer or uncommonly. <clears throat> and vice versa, people who had gastric ulcers wouldn't get a simultaneous yeah. duodenal ulcer. Gastric is cancerous. Duodenal is uh -huh. benign. And so for 20 years, no one had been biopsying patients with a duodenal ulcer. Why do it? They never get cancer. Um, but uh, I found, you know, I, I was one of these people, if I do a project, uh, like they say, Barry, you've got grand rounds on Monday morning, uh, or you've got to present this case of, you know, mitral stenosis or whatever it might be on the medical term. Uh, so, I'd say, all oh, right, I'm going to the library on Sunday, tell my wife, I disappear off to the library at nine o'clock on Sunday morning and start searching the literature because you couldn't do it online in those days. And I, but you know, I would open the, the Lancet or the New England Journal on, on something that I wanted to look up. And I would see on the opposite page, really interesting stuff about <laughs> preeclampsia or something totally irrelevant. <laughs> I'd read that. I said, gee, that's interesting. And then I'd say, well, I'm, I'm going to read up more of that. So about three o'clock in the afternoon then, I still wouldn't have done my grand rounds prep. <laughs> and, and then finally, oh, I'd finish, I'd do about an hour and a half on that. But I spent the whole day just reading this interesting stuff. Yeah. So nowadays everybody does that because that's just browsing the web. You know, you, you see what Google, Google puts up this list of things you might be interested <laughs> on the side there. You say, oh, that's interesting. Um, so it's getting a bit crazy now of what can happen, but, um, uh, so that was, that was the way I used to do things. Um, however, I, I, I was, it is pretty interesting just looking through medical journals and things. So I came across this article from the Mayo Clinic and in 1952, uh, there's this guy at the Mayo Clinic. I think he might've been named Magnus. And he had studied post-mortem motor vehicle accidents. So the thing about Minnesota, I've been there once, but I just stayed underground. It was too cold. You know, you come out <laughs> from the airport, you're underground, you come up in the hotel. Um, so in 1950, you can imagine everyone's driving around in these cars with all steel, terrible suspension, um, <laughs> Um, steering wheels like knife blades and no seat belts. They're having accidents, of course. <laughs> and in, in the Minnesota in the winter, if you have an accident and you're knocked out or killed, you get frozen solid within a few hours. So when they had this post-mortem series, whereas usually in a post-mortem, your stomach just digests itself and you can't see anything. So if you had helicobacter, no one would see it. Uh, but in Minnesota, 
I mean, you wouldn't see the bacteria necessarily, but they have good histology of their post-mortem cases from road accidents. And this guy published this paper. He's not studying the stomach or anything. It was just random cases. He says, oh, you know, 20% of people aged between the age of 20 and 40 male had a duodenal ulcer or a duodenal ulcer scar and 100% of them had gastritis. So no, no ax to grind. He's not trying to prove anything, just the facts. So that really met, told us that we could be on the right track, you know, in the hel helicobacter yeah. gastritis. Yeah. And anyway, on that study, that was, uh, we um, wrote some letters to the Lancet then and pretty hard to get them published. Nobody believed anything about bacteria. Everyone says, oh, not this bacteria theory again. Last year it was CMV, it was <laughs> going to be herpes. Now it's this funny commensal bacteria. And so it was hard to get those letters published. It was six months yeah. before we got the letters published. Yeah. And everyone in America thinks that Lancet doesn't review letters. They just publish them. <laughs> They're too lazy. They just say, oh, yeah published letters but in fact they 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 were um maybe they were getting a bad name or something for that particular year they were publishing letters <clears throat> but studying them and sending them out to review if they looked a bit weird uh, so we got our letters in there and in the letters uh warren described the bacteria that he'd seen in the stomach in association with gastritis and then as a result of my work we'd taken cultures and with a lot of hard work, we had cultured these darn things. And so we could say, you know, they seem to be a new kind of bacterium related to Campylobacter, blah, 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 blah. And then I had done a whole lot of research and literature. And I, what I said to Robin was, look, I've been reading up on stomach cancer. Everybody with stomach cancer has gastritis. And when we look at people with gastritis, the only thing that we can find is helicobacter and here's this other data. So I reckon that you get the helicobacter and then you get mm -hmm. gastritis all over. And sometimes you get an ulcer. And then if you live long enough, you know, all that damage over 50 years of your life right. or something, you might get cancer. So it's not a bad hypothesis. So as sort of the last yeah. sentence in my letter to the Lancet, I said, you know, this could be the cause of ulcers and cancer, something like that. Anyway, it turned out to be right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but it was so, pretty exciting. This, 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 just, I tell you, it just sounds like one adventure every day, which it was. <laughs> so, so in 2005, after all that, in 2005, you, you got awarded the, the, big, the big prize, the Nobel yeah, Prize, for, yeah, the, for, the dis yeah. for the discovery of the bacteria H. pylori and its role in gastritis and uh, peptic ulcer disease. Yeah. How did you come to challenge the theory of the ulcers that the ulcers were not caused by stress? Because everyone around you, <laughs> everyone was just so convinced. How yeah. did you um, come to challenge? Well, as a result, so um, you know, the the I started. I got funding then. So I uh, sort of about nineteen eighty. So eighty two, eighty three. I wasn't funded. 84, I wasn't funded but, and put a submission in. I had a little bit of funding from a pharmaceutical company, was um, Beecham, uh, which were based in Philadelphia then. And um, <clears throat> they made amoxicillin, so a good company to treat bacteria. Um, they gave me a, bought me a computer and uh, gave me a little bit of help, but I wasn't really salaried or anything from that. So I had another grant in, and then I had that publication in The Lancet with Warren. So our first publication was like lead article in the, the Lancet, which was number two journal in the world. New England Journal is always a bit stodgy, but you know, premium. <laughs> um, and so um, I, I was funded for three years, starting in uh, 1985, to do a double blind study, comparing the treatment with antibiotics, eradicating the bacteria versus the standard treatment. And so I started doing that study and, um, you know, I had hundreds of people trying to get into that clinical trial. If, if people find out that it works, you know, they all want to be in it and they all convince themselves they got the active drug. <laughs> so, uh, you know, cause they all got H2 blocker and then some yeah. of them got an antibiotic and some of them got placebo and different things as well. So they all thought they were on the real stuff. Um, so, um, one of the things that I, I realized that this stress was a big belief 
and uh, uh, everybody in the movies was whenever they got stressed, they said, be careful, you know, you'll develop an ulcer, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so uh, that's folklore. And uh, when I studied it, there was all kinds of really terrible research that was the basis of this. You know, it's like there wasn't any data. It was all anecdotal. It started off by Sigmund Freud and people that we really don't believe in anymore. And so, um, I, I, but you couldn't convince people because it, it, one of the other thing is like a religion. And just be aware that, you know, you go through medical school and you do your training. After that, it's hard to change. If people tell you something that sure. wasn't, you weren't taught, you're like, that can't be right. <laughs> so everybody, especially my boss who um, trained at the Mayo Clinic, because they were extremely psychosomatic in Mayo Clinic. And, you know, even one of my good friends, uh, Nick Telly, he trained there and was an irritable bowel specialist. You know, it's in Mayo, they're like, ah, oh, yes, you know, everybody's... Uh, you know, they were abused as children and all these kinds of things. And I, I don't believe any of it. I said, we be honest. We don't, don't know what the cause is yet, but we'll find it one day. Uh, anyway, so uh, that was the attitude that everyone has. And I, I just one of those people that I get, it's, it's, um, it's just that German word. Maybe I got it out of Seinfeld. It's called Schadenfreude. Have you heard that? No, it's, no. it's take it, taking pleasure out of someone else's mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right if it's the other football team, that's all right, or the, the other university or somebody. Uh, so, so it's a bit, it so should be frowned upon, I suppose. But um, the idea of proving someone else is wrong, there's a lot of satisfaction in that if you're right. True. Especially, True. especially in science, you know. So, you know, you do your hard work, they do their hard work. You look at their data, say, it's all wrong because you didn't do this. And we did do it. Much better. Uh, what, so, what so it was think, a bit of that. What made you know that it was wrong, though? Because, like, everyone around you was so convinced it was right. What made you so know Actually, that in there, if you read our Lancet paper, one of these things that we did on people was a thing called a Jung scale. So Jung was one of the disciples of Freud, if you like, 1930s. It's a, a one-page questionnaire on depression psychosomatic illness and it says you know how are you sleeping do you feel better in the morning or in the evening or do you do this so about 20 questions and if you scale if you um you know on this side of the scale you might be depressed if you're on that side of the scale you're not and so if there was some sort of psychosomatic connection um stress being the cause of ulcers well then when people got their ulcer they should be stressed and when they weren't getting their ulcer back, they should not be stressed. Uh, anyway, what we what we did, found we we did these each time the patient came in for a follow up endoscopy, and we found out that relapse of the duodenal ulcer had nothing to do with their score on this scale. However, if they still had the you know it's double blind, but if they had got the placebo and they still had the Helicobacter, even though they were in remission from their ulcer, they scored mm. worse on their Jung scale. If they got the H. pylori eradicated, they scored better. And so there was, you know, it was not a super, you know, super duper top uh, uh, citation uh, attraction uh, paper. But what it meant was that, you know, as far as we could see, there was no relationship uh, with uh, ulcer and uh, psych psychiatric or depression or things. Now, these guys who, the patients in my study, I used to, I wanted this study to finish quickly. So I wanted them to relapse quickly. So if, you, if I saw four patients in the clinic and this one says, oh, look, three weeks after I stopped my Tagamet, I got my ulcer back every time. And now it's going back only two weeks now. And I'm a heavy smoker and I can't give up. So I say, great, you're going in my study. And uh, so I had all these terrible ulcer patients in my study who were these hard driving smoking People, you say, oh, yeah. type A personality, he's going to get his ulcer back, et cetera. Those people did brilliantly once you eradicated the helicobacter. And actually, in my study, I said, look, I've got to keep this, I've got to control all these different variables. So if you're in my study, you, if you're a smoker, you have to stay smoking. I can't have you giving up smoking. <laughs> if you interfere with the smoking. numbers. And so, so we say, that if, if you smoke four or more cigarettes a day, we're calling you a smoker. If you just sort of, as we say in Australia, bummed one off one of your mates occasionally. 
that you're a non-smoker, you see. So, <clears throat> um, so we had these people, uh, smokers, non-smokers, uh, stratified in the, in the study. So that was uh, working out good with the randomization. But one of my uh, women patients, she was a friend of one of my schoolmates. She was his sister, actually. She came half, in halfway through the trial. Um, she said, um, I got a question about the smoking, Dr. Marshall. And I said, yeah, well, are you a smoker or non-smoker? She said, well, you put me in the smoking category because I said that I'd smoke four a day. But probably I never used to smoke that many. And I'm having an awful job smoking that fourth cigarette. I really only need three. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there like, you have to keep smoking. Um, so that, that, was, that was the main thing. But um, after that, I had no respect for anybody who told me that things were caused by stress. So I'm still the same. And uh, people would come in and they tell me all this kind of stuff. I'd say, Dr. Marshall, you don't think I'm crazy, do you? I say, yep, I'm sure you're crazy, but let's just treat this bacteria, <laughs> take these antibiotics and you'll be better and you'll still be crazy. Now, but, uh, now I have a question. Like, do you think that some of the, farm, you, you mentioned Tagamet, do you think some of these pharmaceutical companies that produce the drugs had an influence on the decision makings of other scientists and doctors to not believe in your theory? Do you think they're in their pockets or things like that? Well, they kind of were. Um, as I said to you, I got, a, I got support uh, from... Um, was really Smith Klein Beecham, so it was Beecham in those days, and they then joined up with Smith Klein, and now it's Smith Welcome Smith Klein or something. Um, so, <clears throat> my I spoke to, I presented in '84, uh, and then I had a, I was approached by the rep, the uh, Australian distributor of Tagamet, the head of the the whole shebang in Australia. And he said, look, I'm going to go to the annual meeting in Philadelphia. I'd like to tell them about your bacteria because I think it could be important. And so I'm going to come over and tell, show me all your stuff and give me some of your slides to take over to them. And in return, I'll buy you a IBM PC, which used to cost about $10,000. So I said, hey, I'll be in this. So, um, so he came over and he, I told him all about it. So he knew about it and we went through it and all, and I explained it to him and he took it back to Philadelphia and then uh, told the bosses about it. And uh, then uh, nothing happened. And six months later, someone told him that there was notes being circulated inside the company saying, don't mention these bacteria. Please don't encourage that crazy Australian guy who's managing it over there. You know, we really don't think he's doing any good science. It's all anecdotal or something. So this, so there was that kind of thing. The second part was that they were fun. The, at that time, it was a big competition between Zantac and Tagamet. So Zantac mm -hmm. had just come out, and that was in North Carolina, Glaxo, uh, Research Triangle, so big business, and Tagamet. And so they were competing uh, for the ULSA business. And it was becoming obvious that everybody needed to stay on the drug because of relapse. So this happened... It came out in 75 by 1978, 79 at the uh, American gastro association, people were presenting papers about relapse. And so the, we were at the stage then, well, you keep giving the patient maintenance dose. And then what about the 10% of ulcers that don't heal? And the surgeons were getting happy because they were starting to get patients back into the surgery. Um, People were studying, people at uh, UCLA and T Dallas, uh, San Diego and Boston were publishing drug company funded studies to say my drugs as good as yours. And so to do equivalency studies, the FDA was starting to get a bit smart about P values and uh, power mm -hmm. power of different studies. Yeah. So, you know, you couldn't do a study in the US at that point if you didn't have 300 patients in it. You know, no one, no credibility. Um, so everybody then got hooked into the H2 block of money because they were making three or $4 billion a year. It was the first billion dollar blockbuster drug. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so everybody was connected to this. So all the clinical units were doing trials, which, uh, you know, the protocol would have this thing. So in the middle of that study or when they were just starting it off, Helicobacter popped up. And so you can't then go to the FDA in the middle of your study and say, we're going to change it. Now we're going to take biopsies as well. FDA say, well, you know, you've got to start from zero again. Those first 200 patients chuck out. 
because <laughs> they've done a biopsy on them, you see. So yeah. for reasons that I understand now, they could not change tack in the middle of a three-year study that was costing $20 million or 50 or so. Uh, so there's a, a lot of inertia in that pharmaceutical industry uh, clinical trials. So once it's rolling forward towards the registration, it doesn't stop and it doesn't change. So the, you've got to find these people who are fly-by-nights, if you like, uh, guerrilla tactics, who are going to do it or the competition against that. And so, um, one of the, so the second point I was making there is there, there were so many papers being published on H2 blockers and then the proton pump inhibitors that even if you all the maybe there's only 10 people publishing in helicobacter in the first two years you know it's obviously to get a microbiologist and a gastroenterologist to start talking to each other was pretty difficult yeah. uh, they did so didn't do people just didn't have germs in the stomach uh, so it was slow to gather momentum so the helicobacter papers were so diluted everybody who didn't know would look at the literature and they say well I just read 50 patient papers on H2 blockers and ulcers, and I only saw two papers on Helicobacter. So therefore, Helicobacter must be just like 5%, yeah. 2%, something, very strange cases. So that's, that was the impression. And it was really, that's why it took 10 years for the general practice and everybody to, to catch on, realize yeah. that it wasn't just a smidgen. It was everybody or most of them. Um, and it took a while for that to catch on. Uh, so, I went to the States in 86 <clears throat> and one of the problems also in the U S is they didn't have any treatment because I, I, the treatment I was using was a bismuth product called Dinol yeah. bismuth citrate. Mm -hmm. And that was on the, in Holland and England, Australia, South Africa, outside the U S but I, I was lucky enough to play, I got hold of some Pepto bismol. <laughs> I thought this Pepto bismol, why do people take that? And of course I was sitting there, watching this movie it was probably later but you know later on i saw you know in rain man every time poor tom hanks can't sell his cars opens the medicine cabinet falls out pepto bismol chug -a -lugs it. <laughs> anyway so i had done a, quite a bit of research and i said you know i reckon i remember that before antibiotics people used to take heavy metals they used to take mercury for syphilis and arsenic oh. and timony if you read the old books hundred years ago and you know bismuth they used to inject it to inject it into people for, for syphilis which is a spiral organism as one of the treatments so I said I, I bet that it's not just an antacid I think it might kill the helicobacter so I did some stuck it in a petri dish put it made a disc out of it and put it in and then this is this was actually 1983 and so at that time we weren't weren't certain about the whole thing we're just trying to test different ideas you know maybe it's not true so we were a bit skeptical about it ourselves but the thing about a, a new hypothesis or a paradigm shift it allows you to make predictions about things so you so okay if this thing if bismuth compounds heal ulcers without blocking acid maybe it's healing the gastritis and the ulcers and healing uh, so if that's the case, you know, maybe this stuff is actually killing the bacteria and lo and behold, hang on, it's got bismuth in it. Bismuth used to kill syphilis. So why wouldn't it kill helicobacter? So I did some research on it. Anyway, guess what? Pepto-bismol was invented by a doctor in Connecticut in Norwich. And it was a company called Norwich Eaton and Procter and Gamble had bought them up because they had nice shampoo and different things. One of the funny weird products they had was Pepto bismol and the history of it was that it was recommended in about 1905 for the treatment of infantile cholera. Now what's infantile cholera? I oh, you do a gram stain with the kids loose stools and what do you know? You see these curved bacteria mm -hmm. which we now know they're Campylobacter. Campylobacter jejuni is one of the so infantile cholera in America was actually Campylobacter jejuni and everybody's swigging bismuth <laughs> for stomach aches uh so i said you know so anyway so i did some in vitro work and guess what uh it was just like penicillin helicobacter is the most sensitive the mic is like 12 micrograms per mil and mm -hmm. when you drink it you got about a thousand micrograms per mil 
on your gastric mucosa. So the helicobacter disappears in 30 minutes. It's all just mm. ruptures. So I, I, that, that was interesting. I did a couple of, I grabbed my poor intern and asked him if he'd be a volunteer. And I had a bad reputation in retrospect because of course I didn't have any, um, didn't, didn't have a consent form or a, <laughs> or an IRB <laughs> approval for this. But he said he'd be in it. So uh, I, he was Indian actually. And, and um, he had helicobacter and um, I had a serology test. So that's why I was just testing everybody. So I said, your, your serology is positive. Do you want to come and have an endoscopy? And, and then I'll get you to drink some Pepto-Bismol and then we'll take another biopsy. So I got these beautiful biopsies showing Pepto-Bismol kill the bacteria. And um, my other great patient I had that year was, um, she was actually a St. John of God's nun. And um, she was only little and everything and very, you know, was apparently timid, but she was tough. She said she'd have an endoscopy. So she was one of my second uh, interns who had the endoscopy. I must chase her up one day and give her, send her a bunch of flowers or something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I got some good electron micrographs out of that. But uh, I spoke to someone I knew in England and they were doing a study on furazolidine, I think, that Procter & Gamble had picked up on this purchase of Norwich and talking to the microbiologist in, um, from Cincinnati. And they sort of mentioned that Barry in Australia reckons that your product kills helicobacter it might be an ulcer treatment. So then at midday, I got a phone call in 1984. I said, Barry, um, I'm, um, I can't remember, it's Mike, somebody or other, the head microbiologist in Cincinnati said, Barry, we want you to come to America and uh, give us a, lecture about these bacteria don't tell anyone about it because we might have some plans and uh, and i said oh yeah well i probably i'm pretty busy i've got to change <laughs> hospitals and blah 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 my wife's gonna have a baby and blah, blah, blah. so um when do you want me to come i probably can't come till february so this is like first of november no first of december oh, wow. and i said i can't come for a few months he said oh well, surely you could make a quick trip over before Christmas. So anyway, <laughs> so it turned out on the, um, like about the 12th of December, I got on a plane, went to America and um, did, I gave some presentations. I can't remember much. I was too jet lagged, but I stopped off at, at Tompkins uh, and spoke to Lucy Tompkins in Stanford. And then I went to the Stanford VA and, went up in endoscopy sessions and then I went to Pittsburgh and then I went to Dallas. Dallas was like the headquarters of the ulcer acid business. They didn't believe a word I said. <laughs> and, and, but they're very polite. They're very respected, those old, old Southern gentlemen. And um, so after Dallas and then I went to, oh, I can't remember where I was. I, so then I spent, after, after I'd done a bit of a tour around the country, done half a dozen lectures, uh, and my jet lag was over. Like in the last three days, I just lobbed in Cincinnati and spent the whole three days talking to Procter and Gamble about Pepto Bismol and showing them all my data and all this kind of stuff. So they got pretty excited about that. And I spoke to a fellow in uh, called El uh, Richard McCallum, who was at Yale, and I didn't realise it, but I was actually interviewing. They had oh. set me up to interview, you know, oh. which you, which you do looking for jobs. But in Australia, we don't usually do that. You know, you just say, hey, ask so and so if I can get a job next year. So I was done a bit quieter. So I had done these, done a bit of a rounds for interviews. So the Yale guy was Richard McCallum, who was actually an expat Australian. And he said, oh, he was starting up a department in University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I said, I looked on the list, you know, Charlottesville, most desirable place to live in America or something. So I was like, hmm, that's not what sounds all right. So I ended up uh, getting funded by Procter & Gamble then and uh, doing research related to gastritis and Pepto-Bismol. And uh, so I was funded, fully funded for five years and then, you know, did the boards and everything and uh, was on faculty at University of Virginia then for five years and then was involved with the company developing helicobacter tests. So it was a pretty crazy time and um, we had a pretty interesting life in Virginia. I, I uh, used to travel around and uh, make some pocket money by doing grand rounds and stuff like that, you know, as you do. So, uh, although I was just on a research fellow salary, I probably earn another 30% uh, 
by doing a few lectures and, and that. And it was in, um, so then uh, the big win was David Graham in Houston. So he's chief of medicine. He's getting on a bit now. So he's slowing down a bit, but he was 50. I was 35, I guess. So I think I was 30, might've been 37 when I, no, I was probably 35, I guess, when I, 34, 35, when I went to America. And um, so I remember David Graham was at the American Gastro Association, he was cracking, telling some good jokes. And uh, he was a smart guy. I mean, he was brought up with the US standard of uh, clinical research. Whereas I'm thinking, oh, I'll do 100 patients and that'll be pretty interesting. David Graham's there, like, puts he was a the grant only one in. That didn't tell you no, correct? No, nah, well, he he said the great thing about the helicobacter theory is that it's going to be so easy to disprove. Mm. Now, but what he means by that is that if it's a good hypothesis, you'll be able to test it and disprove it. Yeah. And the way you accept the hypothesis, you couldn't disprove it. So he said, right. I'm going to go after this Marshall theory and disprove it and quickly get the answer. Is it true or not? So yeah. he hammered away. He straight away did a big epidemiology study because the guys in his lab were doing the carbon 13 breath test. They'd sort of okay. done that development work and I was doing carbon 14. Anyway, so he did the carbon 13 breath test and he went out and tested 600 people and published a couple of beautiful papers in gastro. And um, I think in that, paper people were wondering you know where do you catch it and he uh, he kind of said in that paper you just catch it every year one percent and it goes up and up and up and up but when you looked at his data you could see okay the different groups had more and people had caught it when they were a child so that's when at that point my uh, self-experiment paper hit the hit the press with the <laughs> hypothesis and it was, and it explained the whole thing. So it was all hypothesis. And uh, so the editor was sticking his, his neck out in the Medical Journal of Australia to publish my hypothesis about the helicobacter uh, as on the basis of my single uh, experiment. But um, he knew the editor of the Lancet. And so it was editorial, the, the little paper in the Medical Journal of Australia, which no one would ever see, was then the editorial in the Lancet, which everybody saw. So yeah. I went and got my paper out of the Medical Journal of Australia and got thousands of citations or something. Um, so that, that we should talk about that, how that happened. Yeah. So, I, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose I was, that's one of your questions. <laughs> that, that was, but I want to, I want to actually talk about the Swan Brewery pub. So oh, yeah, yeah. that's, 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 that's where you found out with Dr. Warren that you had won the Nobel prize, but yeah. you have mentioned multiple times in the past that the excitement of the journey is more ex exciting than, um, yeah. Yeah. than the, than the discovery of finding out that you won the Nobel prize. What does the Nobel prize mean to you? So, um, I think as the time went on, uh, it became obvious that you needed someone, the ultimate authority to put a stamp on this discovery because there were millions of people that had this and were getting ulcers and surgery all over the world, as you know, and there were you know, probably a million doctors out there who thought it was interesting, but they, they didn't have a lab to culture it. They didn't have a good pathologist they, You know, they weren't in teaching hospitals. How do they tell if it's really true or it's just something? So yeah. if you're a doctor in the middle of Africa, you know, how would you really know that there's not, ju not just another theory? You only got about two medical journals that you get and there's no online stuff. So it was that, that was a situation. And I realized that you needed a stamp of approval on it. And, uh, one, the, after Graham had come across and was in the camp and he and I used to give lectures around and then people at the NIH would talk to me about it and I give a lecture up there. So it was gradually picking up. There was a diagnostic test for H. pylori that got approved by the uh, FDA. So that was a, a, a urease test. So it was sort of hiding up and then the NIH had a consensus conference, 1994, I think. And at the end of that, they said, 
okay, as far as we're concerned, it's almost certainly proven these bacteria are the cause of ulcers and we've now got to figure out how to treat it with antibiotics. And so the, the information started flowing out, but it was still not in every country and there was, you, you couldn't easily treat it. And so, but at the uh, conferences, there were literally thousands, I don't know, maybe just hundreds, but whole rows of posters would yeah. be nothing but helicobacter one after the other. And people from all over the world used to come up to me and Warren and saying, you guys are going to win the Nobel prize. This helicobacter <laughs> is fantastic. Blah, blah, blah. We'd be, we'd be like that movie fight club. You know, like the first rule, <laughs> never mention fight club. So we would say never mention Nobel prize. It's too unlucky. Uh, so the years went by and, um, and I used to say to Warren, just jokingly, well, eventually someone in the Nobel Prize Committee is going to have a duodenal ulcer. And they'll take <laughs> this treatment and they'll say, this is great. Uh, so that might, maybe that, that's what happened. Uh, but as the, as the years went by, you see various you know, guys my age were now becoming professors and being on committees and things like that. And um, I was awarded the Lasker prize, which you know, in the United States, that's like the U S Nobel. And so I didn't know too much about it, but um, the people on the Lasker prize, um, the prize money is not so great. It's, I don't know what it is now, maybe $30,000, but uh, they had the publicity machine in New York city mm -hmm. associated with the Lasker prize means it's a big event. It's a big black tie dinner and yeah. everybody wants to go to it. But the other key thing about it is their committee members, their jury, their you know top scientific guys and and ladies, and they, you know, I met people like Heimlich and Fame De Bakey, you know, people like that. Um, so that's the key. So we've got the Lasker Prize, and so some Swedish people occasionally said to me, Barry, I we heard that your name's on the short list. I said, well, it's all secret. How would you know? I say, oh, you know. <laughs> um, so I, after Dr. Warren retired, I said, Look, each year when the Nobel prizes are announced, why don't we go down the pub? I'll, I'll come and get you. We'll go to the pub, have a few beers, reminisce. And then um, at 5 PM in Australia, because we're out of sync with Europe and the U S they'll announce the Nobel prize. We can listen to it while we're at the pub. So we did this and we did it for three years and uh, really 2003, 2000, 2002, 2003, 2004, it really felt like it had passed us by because everybody was now treating helicobacter and we felt that the interest had peaked and, uh, but I didn't see Robin very often. I still, I see him about three times a year, different activities, but he has his own life. And um, so 2005, I picked him up and, uh, we went down the pub and he usually orders a big pint of black Guinness. Yeah. And I just got a ordinary swan beer and uh, actually my beer is called emu export. It's a, it's a pretty heavy beer actually. And uh, fish and chips. And so the, the waiter was just bringing fish and chips to us and placing it down on the table and Robin's cell phone rang, he fixed it up. And, and uh, the, the Swedish voice says, oh, hello, I'm Professor Hans Jornvals from the Swedish Karolinska <laughs> Institute. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Dr. Warren, I, Dr. Warren, I have to tell you that you've won the Nobel Prize in medicine. And uh, Warren, you know, nothing ruffles his spirits. He's like, oh, okay, that's good. Thanks very much. <laughs> so he's like, <laughs> and he said, wait, wait, before you hang up, um, look, we're not allowed to announce it until we've spoken to the winners by phone and told them first. And we can't find professor Marshall. He's, we don't know where he is. We've called his home. We've called his cell phone and we've done all these things. We, no one knows where he is. And Warren says, Oh, well, he's sitting in the pub with me having a beer. <laughs> yeah. I'll hand the phone over. So, he hands the phone over to me. I say, hello, Dr. Marshall, you've won the Nobel prize with Dr. Warren. It's so great. Blah, blah, blah. So, oh, that's fabulous. Um, so then. What was your reaction? 
Well, I, I thought we deserved it. <laughs> so fair that's enough. That's why you've been I, going to the pub every year. Yeah, that's right. And I thought, well, this is this is great. What's going to happen now? I couldn't really. You've got no idea what's going to happen. It's nothing like yeah. you could imagine. And so, um, I, so, we you know we called all the family. You said, drop what you're doing. Get in a taxi. Get down the pub here. I've got a surprise. We'll tell you something. And uh, then uh, the phone started continuously ringing. So. Yeah. people had got our phone numbers our cell phones were going off all the time so um what i did uh i gave the cell phones to someone from the university i'd take it down to the switchboard at the university and <laughs> at the ho- or at the hospital and and get four or five people to answer all these calls and then <laughs> i will be on my wife's cell phone and we'll do like one call every 30 minutes or something so we, we started then getting on drive time in Australia because 5 p.m., you're 5.30. This is drive time till 6.30 or 7. Yeah. Um, and then so after Western Australia, you realize that drive time is actually a little time zone that travels around the earth for 24 hours. So <laughs> Australia's on the front end of the time zone. Yeah. And um, hang on, who's on the front end? I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it goes... New Zealand is first and then Australia. And then of course you get Malaysia and Singapore and you get China and Japan and Taiwan and India and then Africa and Europe. And so we were then on the phone all night up till about 11 PM and everyone else was getting drunk and we were doing drive time interviews the whole time. So but the, the, the funny part you? about, did yeah, people- well there was, there was about a dozen of us in the end. Okay. Uh, and then, at the end of the night, I was the only one that had was sober. So I had to drive everyone home. So the next day, the next day it was, you know, it was all crazy and exciting. We do press conferences and all that kind of stuff. But a month later, so uh, that's October. So you win the prize in 10th of December, they give you the medal. And uh, so you go there a week before and they, in Sweden, they get you acclimatized and you meet the King and Queen and all the, academy and all those they give you lectures all that kind of stuff so it's pretty busy but you go to this cocktail party with the um nobel prize committee professors so they're physics and madison different groups and you're chatting away with them anyway jorn Valls, who denounced it to us um comes up to me with a serious look on his face he says barry you know the the nobel prize is so secret we don't tell anyone about it I said, yeah, yeah, I know. It's totally secret. <laughs> and he said, but we're, everybody's very worried because we hadn't told anybody. And yet you and Dr. Warren were already down the pub celebrating <laughs> before we called you. And so they had this idea that maybe there's bugging. Maybe we had a bug in the conference room or something. Or somebody had leaked to the press of taking bribes. They didn't know. So, <laughs> all right just relax so, so the, mostly people don't know and it's it is very secret so they um they have a short list and then people on the committee will give a presentation and then finally they might have a short list of say five i don't know what the number would be yeah. and then they will take a secret ballot uh and then that's the nobel so that means the committee has to have maybe maybe they only have three finalists and then they'll pick out the three um, and then they'll pick one out of the three and that one prize might be several people, you know, it might be me and Warren or it might be three people for telomeres or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, uh, so when they announce it, they actually have to have those three websites all ready to go. And then when they pick one, that's the one they switch on at 5.30 uh, Perth time. So 10.30 in the morning or midday in Sweden, something like that. So it's pretty complicated. There is a possibility that someone could know because obviously they have to do some preparation before all the publicity goes out. Uh, so uh, it's all, I always enjoy telling the story and uh, I, I know you guys have read it because I, your list of questions is obviously off the Nobel Prize website. We've had the, it has a biographical article in it. There's actually a few other good articles that have come out of the U S over the years. Uh, Discover magazine and uh, I think Jammer, things like that. So I actually have a question going yeah. back when you were ingesting, you know, your experiment, what was going through your mind? Did you think 
What if this doesn't work? What if anything bad happens? What did your wife think? What was going through your mind? Well, I had, I had said that I was going to, if the animal experiments failed, I may do a human experiment. Um, I didn't say on myself. So if everyone was thinking I'd get volunteers, you see. Uh, so anyway, I was the volunteer. So it, it, it had been, uh, that, so that was 12 months before that, that thesis uh, application had gone in. Um, and the pig experiments failed and uh, it, was a, it was a bad year. Nobody believed me. Um, so I thought, you know, if at that stage I knew that 40% of blood donors in Fremantle, which is the port city near Perth, uh, were positive and they're working, they're perfectly healthy. So I said, it can't be that dangerous. Most people are asymptomatic. That 43%, that sounds like the percent for COVID, doesn't it? <laughs> I think I saw that number. <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, I, you know, I thought about it and I treated this patient with some antibiotics and Pepto-Bismol and stuff and eradicated his germs. So I said, the chances are I'd be able to get rid of it if I got really sick. Uh, so I didn't want to tell anyone about it. So I didn't want to ask the ethics committee because if they said yeah. no, then I still would have done it. <laughs> I still would have done it. <laughs> I'd be kicked out. <laughs> so that's one, one issue. Um, and I didn't want to talk about it because it was a bit embarrassing to do an experiment on yourself. It's very anecdotal, yeah. not scientific. So if you want to do a career in research, please don't start off by taking <laughs> doing experiment on yourself. You'll never make it. <laughs> so, uh, so for various other reasons. And so I just discussed it with my lab tech and uh, he sort of said, Marshall, you're crazy. Anyway. So uh, I had an endoscopy. My boss said, Barry, I don't know why you're asking me to do this endoscopy and I don't want you to tell me. So it was like, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> so he took the baseline biopsies just to show I did not have helicobacter. And then uh, I think a week later, uh, on a, like a Monday, a Tuesday morning, I think I drank the helicobacter. And I actually took a few tagamets as a pre-med beforehand. I was just worried that too much acid might kill the bug. So I just want to give it a good chance. And, um, and then I was, so, so what was it like? So I had the brew in mixed up in beef stock, which is the, what you have in the micro lab is called uh, beef broth. And you just culture anaerobes or anything in it. Uh, and I, so I scraped um, two or three Petri dishes and, and swizzled around in this thing, which is about 50 mils of that soup. And I had done some experiments and I knew that uh, helicobacter didn't smell. It has no smell to it. The only thing it makes is acetic acid. So theoretically it could smell like vinegar, but anyway, so I just drank it down and people say, what did it feel like? And I, well, it was, I say, it's like doing a bungee jump. You know, you've got all the facts, you know, that bungee yeah. jumping is safe. Hardly ever anyone's ever been killed, but you know, it's, you still got to jump off this edge <laughs> into the unknown. Uh, it's not natural. So drinking, the, the brew was like that. And so here goes, fingers crossed. <laughs> and, and um, so uh, I didn't, I thought probably I was just be asymptomatic because I thought at that point that people would be asymptomatic. And then if the gastritis was bad enough, they get um, ulcers. Um, but after about five days, I started to feel unwell. So I got sort of dyspeptic bloating, fullness after meals. So probably I had to delay gastric emptying. I had probably had achlorhydria. And I used to vomit in the mornings and just water, watery stuff would come up. We'd be clear, uh, copious clear uh, fluids just coming out of my stomach and no acid in it. So I did that for about three mornings in a row. And my wife says, you know, you don't look well. You've got a bad breath please stand over there. And so I was like, gee, you know, nobody loves me this week. And um, <laughs> I had this smallish lab. So everyone had moved out of my lab. I were in the, I was in the lab by myself and I was doing a lot of serology on blood donors. So I had plenty of work to do. And I could do it by myself, but I, I didn't realize until retrospect that everyone had avoided me that week. And I just felt <laughs> like I was tired and overworked you know i wasn't enjoying life and i asked people afterwards i said um when i was doing that reese you know took the bug and everything that week and i was vomiting did um any did anybody notice that i had a bad breath because my mother had told me as well 
And everyone said, yeah, well, yeah, we noticed. That's why we wouldn't work in the lab. And I said, well, what's the matter? Why didn't you tell me? They said, well, we didn't want to offend you. You know, you're a nice guy. So, And so I realized then that people who have chronic halitosis, sometimes they just don't know. No one ever told them. They Maybe they live alone or their partner. And so we, we found a someone who had chronic halitosis. He was a microbiology tech, senior guy at Royal Perth. And um asked him about it. He said, no, no one's ever told me. Well, didn't your wife tell you? No. Anyway, guess what? His wife had it as well. So she also, <laughs> had, I think she also had chronic halitosis. They both had H. pylori with low acidity and halitosis as part of it. So um Halitosis has been one of my little side projects. It's hard to research because uh, you know people yeah. don't have it, but occasionally um, I've, people have come to me with it, and uh, we do a GI workup on them pretty much. And if they've got Helicobacter, give them eradication treatment, and about half of them will just miraculously get better. Though after having it for years, it'll yeah. go away. The other half, uh, it's in the back of their throat or somewhere, but not not always Helicobacter. But just remember that you do people a lot of good by getting rid of it. So some, some interesting fact that I don't think a lot of people know about this. The Nobel Medal got you into the VIP entrance of the Shanghai World Fair. <laughs> can, you well, that, talk, can you talk about that? And have you ever been able to use the Nobel Prize to your advantage to, you know, get you into places that you couldn't before? <laughs> Well, I don't know how well how far back Twitter goes, but you should be able to find a picture of me doing something with it on Twitter back in 2010 or something when I was in Canada. But I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. But uh, so Peter Hammond, who was a manager of my research company, and I were in Shanghai, and I gave a lecture there. So I used to take my uh, uh, Nobel Medal and take photos with the alumni and everybody. <laughs> at, at, at the, it was Jiao Tong. Uh, university in Shanghai, so top one of the top universities there. Um, so afterwards, we went to the Shanghai World Expo, which is, this is like 2010, I think it must have been. It was a couple of years after the Olympics, and they still had all the big stadiums and everything. And um, we went to the uh, Chinese expo exhib exhibition, which is the best, and this fabulous giant building that it was in. And uh, when we got there, there was a 300 meter line and of people going in it was maxed out there was thousands of people it seemed and uh we the it was a bit hot we weren't going to line up and go into it wait that long and then um around the side we saw some people going in through this little side door and there's security folks there and everything so i said i oh, come with me so peter hammond and i went to the side door we knocked on the door a security came out and um, we said, well, this is the VIP entrance. And uh, the guy said, uh, well, have you got your VIP pass? I said, VIP pass? We haven't got a VIP pass. <laughs> uh, hang on a minute. And I pulled out my <laughs> Nobel Prize medal. And I said, this is a Nobel Prize medal. Is this good enough? He said, yeah, get in there. <laughs> so, so we bypassed the line. So it does the, the Nobel medal does get you into some places are quite usefully. <laughs> and the other one was when we were leaving um, the, the Sweden and going out through uh, security uh, back to Australia. And so you're in security there. And of course, on that particular day, uh, all the Nobel Prize winners are going through the airport, you see. So that people in the airport know Nobel Prize was last night. So you know. anyway, so it's in your luggage. And so uh, the guy who's looking on the screening of the luggage, he looks at your briefcase or something, and he's a bit of a smirk. He says, okay, what's in this? What's, what can we see there? What's that round thing there? And then, um, so you sort of open up, take out the, they take out the Nobel medal, and then they all show it around, and they're laughing and joking, and then they all start taking selfies with it and <laughs> stuff like that. It's pretty crazy. Uh, so the other, the other one was that... Um, I was in uh, Toronto at the uh, baby's hospital, I think, the pediatric hospital there, and talking about H. pylori or something. <clears throat> and um, the, the fellows were showing me some cases on the ward. So there was a group of about six fellows and me and a couple of students, I guess. We all got in the elevator to go up to 
people or five or whatever. And uh, two seconds after the elevator started to go, it froze up. There was some kind of power failure. So we we're all stuck in the elevator and Twitter had just come out. So it must be in 2010, uh, something like that. And um, so everybody was there on Twitter in the elevator sending help, help. <laughs> we're stuck in the elevator sending out tweets. And so I got my uh, Nobel Prize medal out and we got this photograph of me trying to jimmy the oh door open God. with the Nobel Prize medal. <laughs> so if you, if you look at, um, if, you, if you go through Twitter, my Twitter plus tweets, you can probably find it in there and there's a picture of me jimmy in the door open with the Nobel That's Prize awesome. medal. You wouldn't do that though because it's, it's made out of real now. gold. It's got a little dents on it. Somebody dropped it. <laughs> Very cross. So um, anyway, there's a lot of uh, a lot of fun with the Nobel Prize. The Swedes are great people, and uh, a lot of the I've noticed that a lot of the medical research and science that they do in Sweden, there a lot of people have actually studied in the U U.S., done a fellowship or whatever, been to the NI. So they seem to have good funding for people in Sweden to go somewhere else for a few years on a fellowship or whatever and then come back and so it's very easy to do uh like research in sweden and u.s documentation standard is great and you know it's really like you know one of the best hospitals most of the new hospitals in sweden are really up to what you'd see in san francisco or washington georgetown whatever so um i'm uh I'm always grateful to the good training that I had in the United States from all my colleagues there, good friends, and uh, also um, uh, people talking, at the FDA and NIH and everything. Talking about the United States, you had a green card for the United States, yeah. but then one day you decided to return it to the embassy and, you know, cut it up. You want to talk about, um, about so this that? Is, you know, for people who aren't U.S. citizens who are on sort of visas, it's always a hassle. So everyone wants to get a green card because then you can just go in through the U.S. lineup in Los Angeles and go straight through. It's very efficient now, but it never used to be. And um, so you do all this incredible work to get your family to have a green card. You've got to be tested for syphilis and x-rays. and blah, blah. It costs us about $10,000, I think. So... When people have got their green card, they're protecting them. It's like your birth <laughs> certificate or something. And, uh, but then after I got back to Australia, I still had my green card and the family used to go and visit US every year pretty much. And uh, so we'd all use our green cards. And then I won a prize in $10,000 or something in Thailand. And I was talking to somebody there and he said, you know, if you heard the story about the poor old, poor old Nobel prize winners from America. And I said, no, he said, well, in America, prize money is taxable. <laughs> so when they win the Nobel prize, so they win a million dollars, they've got to give 300,000 to the U S government in tax. I said, that's a horror story because I was hoping to win the Nobel <laughs> prize. And, and I started checking up. If you've got a green card, your global taxable income is visible to the IRS. Not only that, when I was, when I was younger, coming in university, if you had a green card or were doing a fellowship in the United States, they could call you up and send you to Vietnam. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was all these horror stories about people who are at the Mayo Clinic next minute, <laughs> they're in the US Army. <laughs> It's just terrible. So anyway, so I said, oh, I've got to get rid of this green card. So <laughs> I found out there was a form and I got it online or something and filled it all out, took it into the US Embassy in Perth, Western Australia and handed in my green card. And then they, the, the person there said, are you sure you want to do this? He said, you know, I've worked here for 15 years. No one has ever handed in their green card. <laughs> in my I said, uh, no, I don't need it anymore. Yeah. So, you know, they snipped it up. That was the end of it. But I, just to be safe, I still had that document, you know, <laughs> stamped and everything. So they cannot, US cannot tax me. Although they tried to, they tried to. They used to send me crazy bills. And um, eventually, uh, Philadelphia, I gave a lecture once in Philadelphia and they um, sent me a 
So that was Pennsylvania, isn't it? Yeah. So they sent me a, a tax bill for thirty thousand dollars. I said, I only earned seven thousand dollars in my whole life in Pennsylvania. How do I get tax thirty? And I spoke to my uh, accountant in Charlottesville, who's pretty knowledgeable. And he said, they have this, um, they give it to the junior person in the tax department and they say, right, anyone who's a doctor or, you know, some profession um, like that, just make up a number. 30,000 is a good <laughs> number. Try that. <laughs> it's, and 10% you know, of them would just pay it. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and so he said, um, if you do nothing, it'll they'll eventually give up. So we used to write them a letter each year, and that that some poor little uh, African African American girl in Los Angeles or something used to get me on the phone. I'd, I'm not paying this tax. It's really good. And she, Dr. Marshall, this is the third time you've called me. Why <laughs> leave me alone? <laughs> and so, um, so that that kind of thing used to happen. When everything's said and done, we know what you're known for. But what do you want to be known for? Um, uh, I said, well, I think I, I'd uh, I'd want to be known for uh, being in favour of what I'd call um, curiosity-based research. So you don't know where the big, where the next big H. pylori discovery is going to come from. Yeah. And so uh, it's important that the government funds things properly and like funds places like the NIH. And if you, you have to be trained as a scientist to a certain degree, but after that, since you got your ticket, um, you should be able to get, you know, start up funds for any interesting uh, things that you might want to uh, research into. And so um, I say curiosity for based research is where you want to be. And then that'll, that'll uh, bring this most creative and smartest people into the research area. And uh, secondly, I, I know the government's always been criticized for this, but uh, they do need to make sure that uh, clinical research is also funded because the most valuable resource in health is actually the patients and you've got to yeah. collect that information and the people who are collecting that information and looking after the patients, they know what the problems are. And they, if you, if you're just doing lab research, you end up with a, with lots of research, but it may not yeah. be, maybe it misses the important things. Whereas, so you want to have this connection with a research lab and the clinical guys, and then between them, between, with that kind of a connection, bed to bedside, if you like, uh, bench to bedside, uh, then the ideas flow down and, and the products flow back up and you can do the clinical trials and everything. So I've actually seen that formula in a, in a number of places in the United States done very well. And University of Virginia, they did that very well. There's lots of basic research but always a very enthusiastic clinical group and uh, these like clinical research units where if you had a, an idea that's a little bit strange, but interesting, you could actually put patients in for free into those units and get blood testing or whatever you might want to do. So um, it was uh, easy to do that kind of uh, pretty short lead time, test out a new idea when I was uh, in Australia in the 80s. And I think in the right uh, environment in the United States, it's also easy. So if you've got a good chief of medicine, uh, a good boss, uh, and you're in a thoughtful uh, teaching institution, you can do great research in the United States. And uh, I think most of the big discoveries in medicine are eventually, well, they get funded out of venture capital yeah. in the United States and it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but it is, there's a lot of great things about the U S system and everybody in the world benefits from it. We all complain about how expensive everything is, but uh, on the other hand, uh, if it wasn't done properly, if it was done on the cheap, it wouldn't be as good. Yeah, so exactly. uh, I'm always pretty positive about uh, the way things work in the U S and uh very respectful of, you know, big pharma, uh, the big pharmaceutical companies and the ethical side of things in the United States as well. So uh, you can't 
make a movie about people being good though. Yeah. Uh, it's that not going to sell. Well, Actually, the, that movie Contagion, I suppose that was, that was all right. <laughs> Well, we know we know it's late night over there. Um, yeah. and, you know, you, you got uh, things to do. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us. I mean, we can go on for three more hours. Yeah, we'll do <laughs> another one in a few years time. For sure. For sure. <laughs> Sounds so, great. Know, thank you so much for um, taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, my name okay. is Nemo. My name is Aaron. And thank you for accepting our invite.